أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا يسخر قوم عسى أن يكونوا خيرا منهم ولا نساء من نساء عسى أن يكون عسى أن يكون خيرا منهن ولا تلمزوا أنفسكم ولا تنابزوا بالألقاب بئس الاسم الفسوق بعد الإيمان ومن لم يتب فأولئك هم الظالمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن إن بعض الظن إثم ولا تجسسوا ولا يغتب بعضكم بعضا أيحب أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه واتقوا الله إن الله تواب رحيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين <coughs> As brother uh, Muhammad had mentioned previously in his previous talk that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses multiple audiences throughout the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses all of humanity when he says ya ayuhan nas he addresses entire nations when he says ya bani israel he addresses specific people ya ayuhan nabi and he addresses the believing men and the believing women and throughout the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us guidance guidance on how to establish the salah at what times gives us guidance on how to pay the zakat gives us guidance on how to inherit from one another Islam is one of the only religions that gives us guidance on how to use the restroom no other religion does that when Salman al farisi was asked mockingly does your religion even tell you how to use the restroom he said yes of course because this is a comprehensive way of life. So it would be beneath Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to mention how a Muslim society should conduct itself. How a Muslim society, how people in this society should live and coexist with one another. In the verses that I just read from Surah Al-Hujurat, uh, verses 11 and 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs the Muslims of what proper etiquette should be. In the first part of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us not to raise our voices above that of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Further on in the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that it is possible for the Muslims to fight with one another. But at the end of the day that, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ That the believers are brothers and sisters towards one another. But naturally, being human beings, we 
suffer from some of these shortcomings that bring that being human was created in us the issue of making mistakes the issue of being suspicious the issue of deriding and mocking other people that unfortunately is a habit that is learned but is at the same time part of our nature so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us certain rules and certain guidelines about how the Muslims should interact with one another in the first verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا يَسْخَرْ قَوْمٌ مِّنْ قَوْمٌ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us certain prohibitions, certain restrictions, certain things to follow in order to maintain this level of cohesiveness in the Muslim community. The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids is making fun or looking down on any other person. Now, the Mufassirin, the scholars of Tafsir have told us that this prohibition of making fun of other people is not limited to Bain al Muslimin, is not limited to making fun only of other Muslims. But this prohibition is umum, is general, telling us not only are you not allowed to make fun of other Muslims, you're not allowed to make fun of any other type of person, Muslim or non Muslim, higher than you, lower than you, richer or poor. Because when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no difference between male and female. There is no difference between what class or what country you come from. So equally so amongst the Muslims, it should be that we are all brothers. Brothers, unlike the saying goes, not from a different mother, but from the same mother and from the same father. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, yes, to look differently and to speak different languages. But at the end of the day, we come from one source. From Adam alayhi salam. So it is not befitting for us as Muslims then to make fun of, to deride, to pick on other individuals that may look differently, may speak differently, may walk differently than us. This issue of making fun of other people stems from a certain sickness of the heart. This sickness of the heart manifests itself in many different ways. The symptoms of this sickness are many. But the sickness is one. And the issue is pride. The issue of pride is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wanting us to focus on in this verse. Now we can say that pride is, is defined as when somebody feels themselves as being high, as being arrogant, whether it's based off of their position in society, based off of the money that they have, based off of what they drive. And to a certain extent, pride in Islam is acceptable. For example, you are proud to be Muslim. This is completely acceptable in an Islamic context. However, when we are speaking of pride because I'm a doctor or pride because I am Pakistani or pride because I have nice clothing, then this is completely unethical and un-Islamically. It goes against the sharia of the Prophet So pride in, it, in and of itself then is in complete opposition to every single Islamic moral, every single Islamic teaching that the Prophet ﷺ has given us. When we think of pride, what do we use, what's the first thing that usually pops into our head? Perhaps some contemporary issue that we have witnessed in our life. Perhaps somebody that we know. And Islamically we do not have what is referred to in the biblical canon as the original sin. And what was the original sin amongst uh, the Bible? Can anybody tell me? Anybody know? That Adam and Eve? Mm -hmm. Right. 
that, that Adam and Eve disobeyed and they ate from the tree and that sin carries on to everybody that was born after them and according to them billah, that Jesus came and basically died on behalf of all of us to expiate that sin that was performed by both Adam and Eve. Pride also has religious connotations. And when we look to the when we look to the religion of the Jews in Judaism, we see even today that Judaism is predicated on a a pride of ethnicity, an ethnic pride. And if you walk into any synagogue today, you'll notice that you can't just walk in and become a Jew. That you have to be born into the religion. And specifically, you have to be born from a mother who was a Jew. Which is funny because even though Judaism is an ethnic religion that takes pride on its, on its ethnicity, people such as Karl Marx, who was an advocate against all forms of religion, disbelieved in God completely, people such as Albert Einstein, who were completely against any type of uh, institutional organization of religion, they were ethnically Jews. And because they were ethnically Jews, Jews to this day hold them in high regard even though they wanted nothing to do with the religion of Judaism. Pride also takes its form nationally, nationalistic pride. And I'm sure most of you have taken middle school history where we see the complete and utter decimation not only of peoples but of entire continents through European enslavement and colonization where the entire continent of Africa, more specifically the entire portion of West Africa, was completely and utterly destroyed, raped, pillaged, annihilated, when millions and millions of Africans were imported like cattle to North America, based off of what? Based off of nothing other than pride. That we pride ourselves on being European, we pride ourselves on being white, we pride ourselves on being educated, as they say. So therefore we feel it is our inherent right, our God-given right, to enslave these people. More closer to home in Latin America, we know that Europeans came, Spanish in particular, decimated entire populations of Native Americans, how? by bringing disease from the European world, by bringing blankets that were covered in, in, uh, in smallpox, giving them to the Native Americans, thinking that this was a gift, when in reality it was more uh, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And contemporary, also in Europe, we have the Nazis, who again decimated millions and millions of people because they thought that they were the best of creation. That sense of pride now we see is not something that only affects our dealings day to day and our day to day relationships. But pride has the effect to not only eliminate relationships but to eliminate nations and races of people. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have completely and utterly prohibited any type of pride. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a person with a mustard seed worth of pride in his heart will not be of the people of Jannah. And this issue of pride, as we saw, was something that was from the time of Iblis. If we ever talk about a original sin, if we were to have an original sin in Islam, it would be the sin of pride. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the angels to bow down to Adam. That all of the angels bow down. Illa Iblis. Except for Iblis. So if any 
sin were be, to be the original sin in Islam, it would be this sin of pride. So we see this issue of pride through the story of Adam alayhi salam. Through all of our contemporary history, we see this issue of pride. So it's not surprising that the people of Arabia at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam also suffered from this issue of pride. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam came to Medina, and Ibn Hazm said if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was not brought with any other miracle, except for this one miracle, that it would have sufficed him to prove that he was a prophet. What was this miracle? That when he came to Medina, he made peace between Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj. The two tribes in Medina that had been warring for the previous 80 years. But when the Prophet ﷺ came, he was not only able to make peace between them, he was not only able to make them friends, but he made them brothers in Islam. But this sense of pride of nationality and their tribes was still inside of them. Even though they submitted to the Prophet والسلام, they still had this inclination, this human inclination towards where they're from and who they are and where they claim allegiance to. So one of the Jews of Medina was aware of this and sent a young boy to the Muslims from al Aws and Al-Khazraj, the Ansar. And he told the boy, go and recite some poetry. Now poetry back then was the equivalent to basically, how would you say, uh, a formal diss in, by contemporary standards. Because poetry was the main medium of communication that when this boy came to Al-Ansar and he started quoting verses of poetry saying how great a certain tribe was and how, how low another tribe was and reclaiming certain battles where certain individuals were, were made martyrs and where certain tribes were humiliated, that issue of pride then was stirred up again to where Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj began to fight based off of their pride. What had come previously before their Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ then tells us that the arrogant person in this life will be resurrected on the Day of Judgment in the form of ants. And that these ants will be disgraced by people all around them on the Day of Judgment. And that they will be put in the prisons of hellfire and that they will be given the pus of the people of hellfire to drink from. And this hadith is narrated by Bukhari. That the people of hellfire, the arrogant ones in this life, will be given the, the ghisil, the clean, the, what comes out of the wound when it's trying to heal itself, this is what they will drink in the hellfire. The person of arrogance. So Allah then subhanahu wa ta'ala continuing in the verse then explains to us why it is foolish for us to make fun of other people. Where he says it is possible that some of you that are making fun of the other person, the ones that are doing the ridiculing, perhaps are in a lower station than the people that they are ridiculing. And this portion of the ayah was revealed on behalf of some of the companions such as Ammar ibn Yasir Salman al-Farisi Bilal al-Murabah when the people of Bani Tamim towards I, I believe the ninth year of Hijrah when all of the different delegations from the, from the Arabian Peninsula started to accept Islam when they became afwaja when so many different people started to accept Islam in droves and in droves because Islam was the was in was hip at the time. They wanted to get on the winning team, so to speak. So when these people of high ranking joined Islam and they heard the stories of Ammar ibn Yasir, Salman al-Farisi, Bilal ibn Rabah, they started to make fun of them. Telling them, you used to be a slave and I am a nobleman from my clan. We know the story of Ammar ibn Yasir whose parents were Arab slaves in Mecca. We know the story of Salman al-Farisi whose parents were 
Persian. And he was eventually captured and sold into slavery. And it wasn't until about the third year or the, uh, the sixth year of the Hijrah where he was actually bought and freed. And we all know the story of Bilal ibn Rabah. After his immense torture that he suffered at the hands of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And it's funny that, subhanAllah, some of the tortures that Bilal ibn Rabah suffered, they, he was sitting around with Umar ibn al-Khattab one time and they were discussing how they were persecuted in Mecca. This is way after the time of the Prophet ﷺ, after he had passed away. They were talking about the torture that they used to suffer in, the, in Mecca when the Prophet ﷺ had just received revelation. And Bilal was telling them that they used to put me in a body of armor, of metal armor, and they used to set me out in the desert and let me bake under the sun. And they used to heat stones, and they used to make me lay down on top of them. And they used to put huge boulders on my chest and place me on the hot sand. But I always used to say, when they were torturing me, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. So they asked, and Ahadun Ahad is one, one. So they asked him, Ya Bilal, why would you say Ahadun Ahad? Out of all the things you could possibly say, why would you keep repeating Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad? Bilal said, because I noticed that was the thing that infuriated them the most. Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. So this verse then was revealed to tell the people of Bani Tamim, you are not to make fun of these people. Because in the sight of Allah, they are at a higher level than you are. Despite the fact that they were slaves, despite the fact that one was Arab, one was African, one was Persian, it doesn't matter. All of them together were at a higher station than the noblemen of the Arab Peninsula. We also see that the, the, oftentimes the person that is mocking or making fun of the other person is in actuality at a lower state. Such as when the people of Quraysh, when they were ridiculing the Prophet wasallam, calling him a magician, calling him a, a sorcerer, calling him crazy, calling him all the different names that they used to call him. It is obvious that the person that was being ridiculed was better than the person that was doing the ridiculing. To the extent where the Prophet wasallam then would encourage people of a lower class to marry people of a higher class, such as he did with uh, Zainab bin Tujahsh and his adopted son Zayd ibn al-Haritha. And an interesting story about Zayd ibn Haritha, he was from a clan called Banu Kalb, the clan of dog, basically, from the northern part of uh, Arabia. And he eventually was captured, sold into slavery, and was actually purchased by the Prophet ﷺ when? Who knows the story? When was he purchased? Ahsant. So the Prophet ﷺ bought Zayd ibn Haritha when he married Khadija ibn Khuayla and purchased him as a gift for Khadija. So Zayd ibn Haritha, as I said, poetry was the main form of communication. Zayd ibn Haritha knew that every year that people would come to Mecca to make hajj. Now this is the pre-Islamic hajj, where people used to do tawaf naked, where people used to sacrifice animals at the Kaaba to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they knew that people from his clan, people from his area would be coming during the hajj season. So about 9 or 11 months later, he form some lines of poetry that when his people would come he will recite these lines of poetry to them to for them to then take it back to his family to his parents to let them know that he's doing well that he's doing okay so after hajj his brother and his father came to mecca to basically 
by Zayd from the Prophet وسلم, before he was a prophet and to take them back with him. So when they came to the Prophet وسلم, again before he was a prophet, when they came to Muhammad, let's say, when they came to Muhammad, they said, we want to take this servant of yours, he is our son, we want to take him back with his people. So the Prophet Muhammad, he told them, go ahead, let him decide. If he decides to stay, then let him stay. And if he decides to go with you, you can take him. I won't charge you anything. So they asked Zayd, what do you want to do? And Zayd ibn Haritha decided to remain a servant under the Prophet wasallam as opposed to being a free man amongst his own people. Because servitude under the Prophet ﷺ was better to him than being a free man. To show you what the type of treatment the Prophet ﷺ not even gave his own family, gave his servants. And this was before he was a Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So immediately afterwards, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? He took Zayd ibn Haritha by the hand and he went to the Kaaba. And at the Kaaba he said, I want everybody to bear witness that I have adopted Zayd ibn Haritha as my son. And for many years after that, Zayd ibn Haritha was known as Zayd ibn Muhammad. Just to show you that there was no pride when the Prophet Sallallahu then many years later, the freed servant of the Prophet married Zainab bint Jahsh, one of the noble women of Quraysh. When he married the two of them to encourage this type of unity and harmony between the classes of people. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as we continue through the verse, notices, tells us about a second prohibition where he prohibits what we call in present day terms character assassination where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow us to speak ill about somebody does not allow us to call somebody by a name that they do not want to be called by a lot of us have nicknames for our friends for our wives perhaps for our children that they might not necessarily be inclined to. We perhaps as men, and I'm sure some of the women as well, when we give our spouses or when we give our children these nicknames, we do it out of love for that person. But despite our best intentions, that person might not like that name. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to not mention these people by the names which they, which they do not like. In the hadith of, very famous hadith, I'm sure everybody knows the hadith of Bilal ibn Rabah and Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, where the two of them, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, obviously an Arab, and Bilal from Abyssinia, they were in the midst of an argument. When things got heated and Abu Dhar said to Bilal, O oh, Ibn al-Sawda, Oh, you son of a black woman. And when, Abu Dh- when these words escaped the mouth of Abu Dhar, he automatically realized something within himself. Coupled by the fact that the Prophet ﷺ told him, Ya Abu Dhar, Oh Abu Dhar, there is still remnants of jahiliyyah inside your heart. There is this pride of Arab versus non-Arab within your heart. So Abu Dhar dropped to his stomach, put his cheek on the sand, and he said, Wallahi ya Bilal, I will not move until you step on my face. To humble himself, to atone for the thing that he said, to Bilal. And in different narrations, 
Bilal either took up a piece of sand and sprinkled it on the face of uh, Abu Dhar, or that he took some of the sand that was on the bottom of his shoe and put it on the face of Abu Dhar. He took up Abu Dhar and he hugged his brother. Telling us that there is no room in Islam for this Arab, non-Arab, black, white, Pakistani, Arab. There's no room for that. Absolutely none. To the point where some of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, this issue of pride of being an Arab was even inside some of their hearts. In the story when Safiya, one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, who was ethnically a Jew, when one of her horses was sick and eventually died, the Prophet ﷺ asked his wife Zainab, who had two horses, to give Safiya one of her horses. The response of Zainab was, Shall I give one of my horses to that Jewess? Shall I give one of my horses to that woman who's ethnically a Jew? The Prophet ﷺ did not return to the house of Zainab for almost three months after she made that comment. Three months. To show her again and to show us that Islam does not entertain the idea of superiority based on anything else other than taqwa. At the end of this verse, of verse 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those of you that do not repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are indeed from amongst the oppressors. So what is this then issue of Tawbah? What is Tawbah? Tawbah has four conditions. Does anybody know the four conditions of Tawbah? Repentance, when you want to repent for a sin. Let's say you did something that you know you weren't supposed to do. Uh, drink alcohol or gamble or eat pork, for example. What is the methodology of repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What, what are the acts of Tawbah? Does anybody know? Okay, very good. What we call a nadam, a remorse. That the person feel sincere remorse for the actions that they did. Good. That's one. There's four. Okay, to completely stop the action that they are guilty of doing. Okay, so sincerity we said, to distance themselves from the action. Number three. Hmm? To actually vocalize istighfar to say ya allah forgive me to actually vocalize to ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness and the fourth one to make a sincere pledge to never return to this sin ahsantum very good these are the four conditions of uh, accepted toba and there's a fifth conditional condition and the conditional condition is if you hurt somebody else, or you stole from somebody else, or you somehow offended somebody else, then you are obligated then for that, sin, for that repentance to be acceptable, to ask that person for forgiveness. And the people that do not repent, Allah calls them oppressors. He says, if you don't repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are from the oppressors. What do we understand from that? We know that they are oppressors because they were oppressing their brothers and sisters by calling them names, by ridiculing them, by making them feel low. But they are also oppressors to themselves. They are oppressing themselves by not allowing themselves to receive the maghfirah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by actually vocalizing their repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
in verse number 12, the next verse, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, to stay away from suspicion. Now in the first verse, verse 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the public, the, the, uh, the public f expressions of uh, actions that basically disunite brotherhood. So in verse 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the more secretive and the more hidden forms of disuniting brotherhood. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then talks about distrust and suspicion. Now suspicion, as we know, is part of human nature. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even forbade things that lead to suspicion. Such as when there's a company of three and two people start to talk, perhaps in a different language, perhaps in secret. That the third person may start to feel that, hey, these people are talking about me. Even something that perhaps is innocent, the Prophet forbade it because of what it could potentially lead to. So Umar radiallahu anhu gives us a very beneficial statement when he says that if you hear your brother say something, something ambiguous, something that you could be taken the wrong way, perhaps, perhaps could be taken the right way. That what you are supposed to do as a Muslim is to read the best type of interpretation that you can for that ambiguous statement. And after you do so, to f make an excuse for your brother. Perhaps he didn't phrase it correctly. Perhaps he meant something else. Perhaps he was tired and he didn't mean what he said. Because if it were up to us in our Western type of mentality, the non-Islamic mentality, we would pick up on every single slip of the tongue that every person made. As they do in politics. They catch you off guard, they catch you on a bad day, khalas, you're done. But this issue of giving the other person the benefit of the doubt is a fundamental principle in Islamic societies. To give the other person the benefit of the doubt. And especially in the home. Now I have a bit of a short temper, and my wife will tell you. So people such as myself, and I'm sure some of you can relate, when our wife tells us something that perhaps could be taken either way, our duty then is to give our wife the benefit of the doubt. To not get upset. To not become angry. And the issue of becoming angry, especially amongst the men, is very, very rampant and very, very commonplace. And in the 42 or 43 hadith of an nawawi the famous collection of ahadith, had ahadith that were recorded, these hadith are supposed to be what most represent Islam. If you read these ahadith, you will have a completely comprehensive view of what Islam is and is not, what Islam preaches and what Islam does not preach. One of these hadith is la taghbab, la taghbab. Do not become angry. Do not become angry. Notice that it wasn't conjugated in the jama' in the plural, for men and women. Notice that it was conjugated specifically for the men. Even though, yes, this applies to women, but specifically the Prophet wasallam, the intended audience here is the men. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on to say, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا And do not spy on one another. Now this issue of spying is very common in today's society as we all know, I'm sure with NSA and surveillance and wiretapping. But parents, and I'm sure some of your kids are, about to, are really going to like what I'm about to say, that goes even to reading your children's emails, reading their text messages going through their things. Now there's a difference when you have reason to believe that your child perhaps may be involved in something that they're not supposed to be involved in.
that's a different story. But if you want to go through your child's things just for the sake of knowing what's there, that this is completely un-Islamic and unethical from an Islamic point of view. To the point where a, a drunk man came out in public and wine was dripping from his beard. He didn't drink in public, but wine was dripping from his beard. So he was brought to Ibn Mas'ud and they told him, let us commit the had, let us do the punishment on this person for drinking. Ibn Mas'ud asked him, did you see him drinking? They said, no, he was in his home. Then we cannot use this as a proof. The man is drunk in public. The man has wine dripping from his beard. But because they did not physically see him drinking alcohol, they cannot execute the punishment on him. Because there's no spying in Islam. Now the, the main point of these ayat then is the issue of backbiting. Talking about another person behind their back. And the Prophet wasallam, in no uncertain terms clearly defines what backbiting is. And the Prophet wasallam, said it is to mention something about your brother that your brother does not like. To mention something about your brother that he or she does not like. So they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, what if what we're talking about is actually present in this person? What if this person really is lazy? What if this person really is a drunkard? What if this person really abuses their family? The Prophet ﷺ said, if it is present in this person, then you have backbit. And if you made it up, if this is truly not in them, then you have slandered this person. Both of them are major sins in Islam. And one of the rules of determining whether or not an action is a major sin in Islam is if the hadith or the ayah couples this statement, this prohibition, with some type of punishment, with some type of treatment in the next life. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Would you like to eat the flesh of your dead brother? Telling us that this is a major sin in Islam. And we have the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when a man came to him and, they, and the man told him, there are these two women over here who are fasting, that are dying of thirst. Ya Rasulullah, give them permission to break their fast. And the Prophet turned his head. And the man kept pleading with the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, give these women permission to break their fast. And the Prophet then eventually told the man to bring him a bowl. So the man brought a bowl to the Prophet ﷺ and the two women were brought to him. So she told, he told the women to vomit into this bowl. And this hadith is narrated by Ahmed. Told these two women to vomit into the bowl. And after they were done vomiting into this bowl, you could see pus and blood and chunks of meat and flesh within the bowl. And the Prophet ﷺ told these women, told the people that were with them, that you fasted from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made halal for you. But you broke your fast with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made haram for you. And I'll end with this, inshaAllah. Because, how many of you are in high school? One, two, three, four. What is high school predicated on? Social, the social aspect of high school. What's the senior will predicated on? Are you familiar with the senior will? Anybody know what a senior will is? Nobody knows? They, do they not do that anymore? Did you have that would a senior will in high school? Did you have a senior will, Muhammad? <laughs> so I had a senior will. So a senior will is basically when seniors in high school, now don't go and do this, I'm just telling you what, <laughs> what this is. 
uh, a senior will basically is when some some of the quote unquote popular seniors uh, they want to there's perhaps some girl or some guy or some group of people some teachers perhaps that they didn't really like throughout high school so on the last few days of school they write what's called a senior will and basically they put on blast all of the different people that they didn't like in high school I remember one girl uh, her name was Heather she used to have really long bangs so in the senior will they told her hey Heather the 80s called they want their bangs back so just complete just blasting of different people from from what they wear to their hair to how they walk everything so basically high school is, at least when I was in high school, which was centuries ago, is the social component of high school is really based on what this person has and what this person doesn't have. How this person is cooler than this person. How this person is more popular than this person. Hey, how can I belittle this person in the eyes of this person so to elevate my status and to put this person down? when we perhaps especially in in family circles and I'm sometimes we're a lot of us are often guilty of this I know myself sometimes when we're talking to family members that we haven't really talked to in a long time they always give us the juicy gossip of what other family members are doing hey do you know your cousin so-and-so oh my god I can't believe it she's pregnant oh what happened oh do you know your uncle he filed for bankruptcy oh no what happened do you know your cousin, this one who's in, back in Pakistan, that they did this and this. Oh no, what happened? So we're guilty of a lot of this, this backbiting and we don't really realize it because we're talking with family. And sometimes when we do realize it, we feel guilty and we don't want to be a joy kill and we don't want to be a party pooper and tell them, hey, what you're saying and what you're doing is not correct. But when we know that something is right and we know that something is wrong we have to then take the courage and we have to take the initiative to point it out to the other person or at the very least leave the gathering from which this is taking place and one of the shuyukh um, from Saudi Arabia he was in a gathering uh, with the king and with some ministers and with other with other uh, mashaykh and basically you don't just get up and leave when the king is sitting in the room and some of the people from the cabinet started talking about a specific person and they started blasting a, sp a specific person they started backbiting a specific person and this sheikh all of a sudden just started breaking down and crying crying and crying and crying so they asked him later, Sheikh, why were you crying in, in the middle of the majlis, in the middle of the gathering? And they said, because I was crying because I couldn't leave the gathering. And I was afraid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to write me with his people just for being seated with them because I couldn't leave. So when we hear these types of talk taking place, what should we do? And we started the lecture with verses from the Qur'an and we started lecture with the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should end this speech with the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the number one source of tafsir? Before the Sahaba. Before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The number one source of tafsir is the Qur'an that we take verses from the Qur'an to explain other verses of the Qur'an. For example, وَيْلُ musallin, Woe to the people that pray. If you were to just take this verse, you would never pray. But what's the next verse? أَلَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ The verse explains the previous verse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hujurat, to stay away from making fun of people, to stay away from backbiting people, to stay away from spying people, to stay away from, sus from being suspicious of people. He also gives us the solution on how to do these things. In Surah An-Nur. 
And I'll read these verses and their translation, and inshallah we'll end with this. And this is verses 12 and 16 in Surah An-Nur. <clears throat> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لولا إذ سمعتموه ظن المؤمنون والمؤمنات بأنفسهم خيرا وقالوا هذا إفك So in verse 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Why when you heard it, it being this accusations, these suspicions, these, these negative things about people, did not the believing men and believing women think good of one another? Why didn't they think good of one another? And why didn't they say, this is an obvious falsehood? When we hear these negative things, why don't we give each other the benefit of the doubt? And why isn't the first thing that we say, hey, you're not telling the truth. That this couldn't possibly be the case. And in verse 16, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ لَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ قُلْتُمْ مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَن نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا And why when you heard it did you not say it is not for us to speak of this? So Allah tells us when these things are brought up to you to number one Give the person the benefit of the doubt. Number two, to say that what you are saying is not true about this person. And number three, to say it is not befitting for us to speak about these things. These are the solutions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, these tips on how to execute these prohibitions. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in iman and in taqwa. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in righteous deeds, to forgive, of us, to forgive us of our sins, to accept our good deeds, to forgive our parents of their sins, to increase us in beneficial knowledge, to gather us in Jannah in a gathering similar to this. Subhanallah wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk, wa jazakumullahu khayra. Uh, if there's any questions or comments, uh, we can take a few minutes, inshallah. Other than that, we will uh, proceed with the rest of the night's program, inshallah. Fadlan. So the question was, the, the brothers from Palestine, uh, may Allah free Palestine. And um, he wanted to know, is it okay for me to take pride in being from, from Palestine? Uh, well, let me ask you, did you have any say in where you were born? To whom you were born? What year you were born? So to take pride in something that you had no control over, had no say in, had nothing to do with, does that logically make any sense? So yani everybody has a certain natural inclination to want to associate with somebody, want to be belonged somewhere, wants to belong to something. And not specifically you, because obviously I've met you for the first time, I don't know you, but individuals a lot of times when they want to have this sense of pride in an ethnicity is because they haven't f 
fully reach the level of taking pride in being Muslim. Because pride in being Muslim is bigger and wider than being proud of where you're from. Because your Islam is something that you do have control over. You can be Muslim, you can be non-Muslim. You can be obedient of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can be disobedient. So to be proud in the fact that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in my opinion, would be better than taking pride in where you're from. Now, if you want to say, hey, I'm proud of being Palestinian and oh, you know, hope nobody's Egyptian in here. You know, Egypt sucks or something. I don't know. You want to say something like that jokingly amongst friends or whatever. I would just be careful. Because you never know, somebody might actually take offense to that. Somebody with perhaps low iman that really cherishes Egypt with their heart and their soul might take offense to that. You would be doing exactly what the verse says not to do. So just try to keep it your pride of being Palestinian, which is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did give to you, to recognize that it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to not take pride in it as if it was something that you had any control over. Wallahu a'lam. So basically you can ask the question, um, there are certain moments Islamically where you're allowed to uh, expose the faults of another person. Uh, those being when it's an issue of amana, when somebody perhaps might be taking a position of leadership, when somebody might be in charge of a certain thing where you know that this person is prone to cheating or this person is prone to stealing and it affects the community at large then you are allowed to expose this person or for, perhaps somebody comes to me and they ask me hey do you know Muhammad and I know that Muhammad not this Muhammad let's say another Muhammad has a gambling problem for example or he's uh, addicted to crack or something it is my obligation then to tell this family that this person has these faults and you probably shouldn't wed your daughter to this individual. Um, with regards to critiquing the policies that a person does, that's different than critiquing personal flaws in the person. Right? For example, let's say Obama, you know, we all obviously hate his his policy on on drones and and even drones in the United States we can critique his policy but let's say we know that Obama for example you know uh, cries when he watches chick flicks or something okay and he doesn't like that people know that then in that instance because it's something personal to him that would be that would be backbiting but again Policies are something that he's done in public. So when the person is doing it in public and everybody knows about it, then that's different when the person is hiding it in secret and doing it in secret and then exposing that flaw of that person. But it is best yani, to, to leave the kalam of people, just to, to not talk about people because it's a slippery slope. Once you get started, yani, it's very hard to dig yourself out of it. Wallahu a'lam. Yes. I'm talking about, I'm sorry? Oh, being prideful? Mm -hmm. Um. 
you know, uh, the question was, how do you protect yourself from being prideful? Well, the answer is not to shy away from being great. Um, a lot of people, especially in the Muslim community, especially amongst the youth, I feel, they don't want to aspire to be something great because they're afraid of falling into pride. I don't want to be the best guy on the football team because I don't want people to think I'm arrogant. Or I don't want to go to, let's say, Berkeley because I don't want people to think, oh, wow, he's going to Berkeley. So the issue is not achieving greatness because we, how many scholars in history have, do we know that have achieved greatness but were probably one of the most humble people in their community of perhaps even generations. So the issue is then, how do we attack pride itself? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an how a person should remain humble. And one of the things that we do as an individual is to remind ourselves where we came from. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we were at one point in our lives a nutfa. Do you know what a nutfa is? Hmm? Do you know what a nutfa is? So a nutfa is, for a lack of better words, uh, the male and female liquids mixed together. So every single one of us in this room came from a nutfa. And to the people of the Arabs, and I'm sure for most of us in this room, the concept and the idea of a nutfa is pretty disgusting. In the sense that you wouldn't want to touch it, you wouldn't want to look at it, you wouldn't want to have any part to do with it. So if we came from that, then who are we to think ourselves better than anybody else? And there's a very... Uh, Touching story of Umar ibn al-Khattab when he told the, the person, the mu'adhan, to call the adhan in the city. And it wasn't the time for prayer, so they knew that something was up, that Umar wanted to make an announcement. So he stood on the minbar and he told the people, you know, I used to be a herder of sheep and camels for al-Khattab, for his father. And my father was very harsh with me. And I used to be one of the poorest people in my time. Jazakallah khair. And he left. So they asked him, Ya Umar, what are you doing? You're the leader of two-thirds of the known world. How can you just degrade yourself in front of these people? He's like, because the thought, the thought crossed my mind as I was walking through the marketplace that I am the overseer and I am the ruler of these people so it's an exercise it's like a muscle and if the muscle is weak and you allow these feelings of pride to seep in then you suffer from atrophy and when you try to humble yourself you can't so when you start to feel these things like hey I just did something alhamdulillah somebody compliments you alhamdulillah Somebody says that you look great or you did something great or you, hey, you know, uh, you should be proud of yourself. Alhamdulillah. Because we came from that nutfa. And everything that, we get, that everything that we got, everything that we did, everything that we have accomplished would not have been possible without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Correct? Is there anything in your life that you could have done without Allah? So there's nothing to take pride in. We didn't do it ourselves. And all of the hamd and all of the shukr, lillah. All of the praise and all of the thanks belongs to solely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no way that pride can creep into our hearts. Because we know the reality. And if we're honest with ourselves, pride should not be an issue. Sometimes it is and we got to check ourselves. And we check ourselves with alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Oh, yeah. Any other ones? Yes, sir.